Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Just Infrastructure Speaker Series. And for those returning, welcome back. My name is Kiri Karahalios, and along with Anita Chan and Indy Gupta, my fellow colleagues of the Just Infrastructures Initiative, we will be your hosts for today's event. We will be live tweeting today's event using the hashtag hash just infrastructures with a capital J and capital I. For those of you who don't know us yet, Just Infrastructures is an initiative created by researchers to interrogate the complex interactions between people, algorithms, and AI-driven systems. You can learn more about us and see more information about our next event with Lily Irani on April 28th at our website at just-infras.illinois.edu. A link has been added to the chat and you can see our full spring calendar of talks there too. We would like to thank our funders and sponsors, the Computer Science Department, the School of Information Sciences, the Granger College of Engineering's SRI program, Capital One, and the Community Data Clinic for supporting this programming. We also have a long list of non-financial co-sponsors you can see on our website, and we would like to thank them as well. To ask a question, please use the Q&A box. We'll go through the questions at the end of the talk. Closed captioning and American Sign Language support is also available. Please use the chat to request any tech support and a note that this talk is also being recorded. And I'd now like to ask you to join me in a land acknowledgement. As a land grant institution, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign has a responsibility to acknowledge the historical context in which it exists and the exclusions and erasures of the indigenous peoples on whose lands it is located. We are currently on the lands of the Peoria, Tuskaskia, Piankasha, Vea, Miami, Mescoutin, Ottawa, Sauk, Meskwaki, Kickapoo, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and Chickasaw nations. This acknowledgement demonstrates a commitment to beginning the process of working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. Acknowledgements invite us to ask, what does it mean to live in a post and neo-colonial world? What did it take for us to get here? And how can we be accountable to our part in history? We'd now like to turn it over to our esteemed presenter. We are extremely honored to have Dr. Suresh Venkatasubramanian with us here today. Suresh Venkatasubramanian is a professor at the University of Utah. His background is in algorithms and computational geometry, as well as data mining and machine learning. He is well known for his contribution in these fields and for how this work led him to pioneer work in algorithmic fairness. That is, ensuring that in a world of automated decision-making, decisions that get made about us, for us, are fair, accountable, and transparent. He is a founding member of FACT, the Fairness, Accountability, and Transparency Conference that has, been ex has seen exponential growth in the past few years. His work has received press coverage across North America and Europe, including from the New York Times, NPR Science Friday, NBC, CNN, Hacker News, and many more outlets. He's a member of the board at the ACLU of Utah, a member of the Computing Community Consortium Council, and his work directly impacts algorithmic policies today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Suresh Venkata Subramanian. Suresh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kerry. And thank you to the uh, Just Infrastructure team. I'm very honored to be part of the speaker series. It's been a great series you've had so far, and uh, I hope I can do justice to it. So um, my talk today um, is a bit tongue in cheek. Uh, it's, it's an attempt to well, let me tell you about it. So this is, there's a very nice website um, that talks about critical algorithm studies. It's a website developed by folks at Microsoft Research. And they talk about you know, a growing critical literature and algorithms of social concerns, spanning a bunch of different areas in the social sciences. One thing that of course piqued my interest was this little note there that said that the list does not contain much writing by computer scientists. And among other things, this got me thinking, what does it mean to do critical algorithm studies work from inside computer science. And so what I'm hoping to do in this talk today is sort of lay out sort of some of the ways in which the work I've been doing, especially of late, has been informed by this kind of critical perspective on, the, on, on developing algorithms and developing especially algorithms that use machine learning and what that critical perspective brings to the table, especially when we talk about issues of AI and bias. Now, of course, 
The story of AI and bias is by now a very well-known story, and you've been hearing a lot of things about this, Sarah. You know, we've talked about the problems of deployment of data-hungry ML-based algorithms, the soaking up transmission and amplification of various kinds of societal biases, most notably racial and gender biases, the quest for formalization of fairness and the realization that what we're really talking about is a wholesale reshaping of society around algorithms and their ability to unearth patterns that purport often incorrectly to describe and predict things about us. There are many, many books on this topic now, and you've probably read some of these. The most recent one, I think is like five days old, is Kate Crawford's new book on the Atlas of AI that I'm really looking forward to. As Kerry mentioned, there are many conferences, one that I've been proud to be part of helping start, which is a conference on fairness, accountability, and transparency. But there are many more now sort of reflecting on this, this ferment of disciplines that, that, that speak to the questions of algorithms in society. And this is a, a complex picture, right? It's a picture that has many, many parts to it. And I kind of think about it this way. If you think about sort of this from a 30,000 foot view, it's not just about systems. It's about infrastructure, of course. It's about accountability and auditing for these infrastructures. It's about legal frameworks, policies, values, society and culture, all interacting in very complicated ways. These, the way I think about the work I do is that it, it bridges these things. These little lines you can see on the screen are essentially my attempt to understand how the work I do is situated between these boxes rather than inside any one of them. And what this perspective, this complex perspective, this role in which technology seems to be only one part of the puzzle has made me think about is what is the role that a computer scientist can and should play within this network of interactions. Now, in my capacity as a technologist who thinks about the social impact of machine learning, I'm often confronted with this dilemma. Should I, as people have often said, stay in my lane, sort of think only about technology, me inside the black box here, and let society, this big cloud, who, people who think about society who, are, who have spent you know, a lot of time pondering the way in which society structure, let them think about tech? Should I, and I've done this as well, act as a kind of explainer for technology, as a, someone who explains technology to the folks who are trying to figure out how to solve the problems of a tech-enabled society? All of these are roles I've played, but I think there's another role that's becoming more and more important. Um, something that I've been thinking about a lot, which is that the language of com computer science itself, the language of computation, the way in which algorithms work, have both the tools that can speak to our current situation with a tech-enabled society and also have blind spots that suggest why you know, technology in itself is not part, cannot be part of the solution, has to be introspected upon. And in that regard, there's a very nice paper that I would highly recommend anyone who's interested more in this topic sort of read by Radiat Abebe, Salon Barakas, John Kleinberg, Karen Levy, Manish Raghavan, and David Robinson that sort of explores this particular question and the roles of computing. And so a lot of what I'm doing is inspired by sort of reading stuff like this. But what are what does a critical study mean? Right? So to the extent, to the very little extent that I've begun trying to engage with sort of critical work that come from other disciplines, one thing is clear that critical studies have a reflexive essence, right? They look within and reflect on how the structure of a field and its elements and the way it's built force certain perspectives often silently and eliminate others from consideration also silently and importantly. So critical algorithmic studies as we are beginning to conceive of it really asks us to reflect on the nature of the modeling that we do, what biases and what blind spots this modeling carries with it and how we can ensure a degree of flexibility, kind of epistemic flexibility that allows these infrastructure and values to work with each other rather than against each other. Over the past many years, actually, we've seen a number of examples of this critical instinct, if you wish, to coin, use a term that Helen Nissenbaum coined, um, emerging within CS. Of course, there's the original, well, one of the original works that I, I find sort of very uh, inspiring by Batya Friedman and Helen Nissenbaum from 1997 on, it's called Bias in Computer Systems. And it's, it basically argues for the fact that in fact, computer systems can have biases. Something that, you know, today we would probably not question, but in 1997, at least, you know, people weren't really talking about in, in the computer science world and is a very, and therefore it's a very prescient paper. There was a, a, a sort of a position piece that Phil Rogoway, who's a cryptographer put out in 2015, which caused quite a lot of, you know, um, uh, discussion at the time where he asserted that crypto working cryptography has a moral character that he argued, 
uh, that the cryptography community in their focus on technical work had maybe forgotten a little bit or maybe needed to pay more attention to. And as you know, spawned a lot of discussion about the role of cryptography and cryptographers in society today, especially since a lot of the things that cryptographers think about have, have an impact on you know, even things like Bitcoin or things like surveillance and so on. And you know, in that regard, Seni Kamara's sort of crypto 2020 talk called Crypto for the People is another very inspiring argument for how we need to bring this perspective, this critical perspective into how we frame questions in cryptography. Um, in that light, a very nice paper by uh, Chelsea Baribas and others from uh, the FACT conference last year sort of asked, how we should think about the way we formulate technical questions, especially on fairness, with a lens towards power. Who has power, who doesn't? And should we be building systems that perpetuate systems of power versus systems that you know, can reorient how we think about power structures? Um, some work that I've done in the past few years has taken similar perspective saying, okay, if we think about algorithms as inhabiting a socio-technical system, what are the blind spots and the strengths, if you wish, of algorithms, their abstraction and other sort of ways in which they're built that can be weaknesses in a socio-technical system. And then recently a position paper that I helped write with Nadia Bliss, Helen Nissenbaum and Melanie Moses sort of argues for a more sort of interdisciplinary approach to understanding AI's impact on society. All of these works, whether they're position papers or technical works, have a certain common flavor to them, a flavor that I want to explore more uh, in, the, in this talk. And that flavor is that the value-laden evaluation of a system, right, or of a, or the, of a building of a system has this sort of steps to it. The first thing you have to do if you're inspecting an existing algorithmic framework is what are the values the large broader societal values that seem to be inherent in this. And this is tricky because after all, an algorithmic framework is often expressed in mathematical no notions, right? It's very formal notions. And you have to sort of reason about how those mathematical formalisms, the way things are optimized and so on, might actually be forcing certain kinds of values to be emphasized versus others. The next move in this, in this analysis often involves saying, well, now that we understand what values the system is capturing, we can in fact argue that it is unable to capture other values that we think are important, that society or the people, stakeholders in the system have decided is important, which then allows us sort of the next stage, which is to say, can we design new frameworks that do capture a little bit more closely the normative concerns that we have? Now, this is all, of course, still very abstract, right? This is a very abstract way of thinking about this. What does this mean for the spirit of the series, which is about just infrastructures? And I was thinking a little bit about that. In some sense, there's this two words, and I'm, I'm, you know, this is of course deliberate, right? Has very interesting components to it. You talk about just or justice, you talk about values, and you talk about infrastructure, you talk about systems. And of course, everything in this is about how values and systems interact with each other, right? And so if you, you know, one of the personal turning points in my own thinking around algorithmic fairness was at this uh, 2019 FACT conference where we had a town hall meeting with the community. And one of the attendees got up to challenge us to reorient how we thought about algorithmic fairness, to think more about justice than about fairness. And what she was exhorting us to do was to think about issues around inequality and discrimination and seek to address them directly, rather than the more abstract concerns about measures of fairness that many of the community, like myself, were beginning to be focused on. This, in a sense, is a critical perspective, right? It's a, in, the, in the sense of the critical perspective I'm talking about. It was one that I, frankly, or initially resisted because it essentially called upon computer scientists to get off the sidelines and engage in the ongoing debates about inequities in society and how to obtain justice for those left behind. But over time, I've begun to realize the, the power and the, the value in that perspective, and it's become an animating principle for how I, I would like to think about problems in this space. And then going back to this critical lens that we talked about, through the lens of justice and infrastructure, maybe a way to think about this is that maybe what we want to do is focus on the injustices that might be implicit in an algorithmic framework, demonstrate the inability of such a framework to speak to concerns around justice and equity, and design new frameworks that seek to move us closer to equity. Now, again, I don't want to fall into you know, what is often called a solutionism trap. I'm not saying that the technologies we develop will solve the problems of, of inequity. It's just that we want to make sure that our designs are more harmoniously aligned with the values we want to portray. So the values in some sense have to drive the design rather than the values emerging from whatever design we happen to come up with. So I, will, I want to talk about 
two examples that talk that sort of focus on this. It's going to be sort of a little example of how one might go about this. This is by no means an attempt to claim that we've I figured out how to do this. But these are some examples of my sort of stuttering, hesitant attempts to try and engage with critical thinking around algorithm systems, but again, from inside computer science, using the language of com computation, the language of optimization, the language of machine learning to think about this. And the problem I want to talk about is the problem of access. In most of the literature on algorithmic fairness, at least currently, and again, at least within the computer science community, and I emphasize that because it's a much broader topic as well, the question, which is often called a problem of allocation or classification, is fundamentally about allocating a resource to individuals. Now, this resource might be a job. It might be a loan. It might even be your freedom from being detained on bail or you know, given not being allowed to have parole. It might be some kind of police presence in your neighborhood. But fundamentally, it's an allocation question. And while resource allocation is an important problem, it doesn't capture something that we are seeing as even more important, especially over the last year, the problem of access. Whether it's access to you know, COVID testing or COVID treatments or vaccines even right now, or information about the pandemic or information about appropriate behaviors and actions, um, this has been something that's been a bit of a challenge. Um, and of course, 2020 was also an election year. And we've seen that another problem about access is one about access to democracy uh, in the form of voting. And the central question here is not so much how to allocate a resource, but to make sure that the resource, which is often not limited in the normal sense, is accessible in an equitable manner to all. And so it turns out that when we think about this problem of access, we run into a problem that we've run into before in this field is, what does it mean to have equitable access? And how might we even define it in a way that we can sort of bring our technological sort of focus to bear to it? And in both the examples I'll talk about, this turns out to be a little tricky. And it leads to sort of a, an attempt to pivot away from traditional ways of looking at certain questions towards new ways, which hopefully will lead to another, a, a, a broad set of directions to explore in how to think about fair access. So let's talk about um, one version of this question, sort of a physical access problem. Let's say we have some kind of resource we want to provide access to. This could be you know, COVID testing facilities or vaccination sites. It could be early voting boxes or polling stations. And the way we provide access is by building a facility that provides that resource. Right, so look at this sort of somewhat stylized map of Utah with dots representing population centers. If you, if you know Utah, you know that the, the, the collection of dots in the upper area is the Salt Lake Valley where, you know, the Salt Lake metro area where a lot of people live. And the collection of dots down south is in San Juan County on native lands. Now you might decide to place a few facilities to provide whatever resource you want to provide. In this case, for example, you might provide three facilities in this area and one facility in this area. So what does it mean to say that we've provided equitable access to this resource? Well, in this particular case, if the colors that I've used for these dots denote different groups of individuals, we might want to know whether different groups have similar access to resources. And just like how in the world of fair decision-making, the problem of making fair decisions has become a problem of in what they call a machine learning fair classification, here the corresponding problem is what is called fair clustering, the problem of grouping groups of, of points here or groups of people into collections, each served by a certain facility. And so again, this has been a question that people have looked at over the years. Uh, maybe not with this, with the notion of access in mind, but just as a question of what fair clustering might look like. And one of the early sort of proposals on these lines was a paper a few years ago uh, that proposed the idea of balance. The concept was the following, that again, if you have a collection of of points where points represent you know, individuals and colors represent some kind of grouping. The premise is that clusters, the way you group individuals should be representative of the groups. And so each cluster you form, you know, where the cluster is represented by the black dot and it's about the grouping, should have the same kind of proportion of the population as the overall population. So in this case, if you had a 50-50 split between the two colors of points, each cluster should itself represent a 50-50 split. And this is very similar to the idea of a classifier that's good while also being balanced in how it treats points of different colors. What you're saying is that we expect that each cluster will somehow represent the entire population. And so it should be as representative of the population. But balance, you know, it's a useful notion, 
it doesn't quite appear. So again, this move from what is the, <clears throat> excuse me, a value that the proposed measure is trying to capture, does it capture what you want? And balance while a useful notion doesn't appear to be able to capture what we want from access. If we're thinking, for example, of people traveling to obtain a resource, then the actual distance from the center of that group matters. And it's entirely possible then to have a clustering where one group is asked to do much more work to travel. In this case, the group which has the blue points is asked to do more work to travel to the facility than the other, even though from a point of view of balance, you have achieved this. So if we have this idea of a goal of fair access to resources, and we have some current notions that seem to capture that, but don't, what should we do? Can we come up with a different way to formulate the question that we want? Well, one proxy, and this is a proxy for effort involved in gaining access is distance, right? Just physical distance, how long it takes to get there. If you, and, and for example, we know that in the case of voting, the further you are from a polling station, the less of a chance you will actually get out and go vote, right? So, you know, so one thing you might say is, well, what we want to know is to measure the distance it takes to get to a, a center of a, of a facility, or to a facility you want to get to. And you want to measure this for different groups. Now, what you might want to say is, well, we want to make sure that for each group, the average cost of getting to the facility is the same. And of course, you could then essentially get a solution by making the cost for every group to be terrible, which you don't want. So what you want to make sure is that, you know, the worst possible scenario, the worst, the, the group that is, suffers the most in getting access has the best access possible. So that you can think of this as kind of a, a maxi min or a mini max kind of situation, or it's like a full Rawlsian approach, where you want to say that the group that has the worst access should have as good access as possible. And so this sort of more formal version of what I said is basically this min, min over max, right? But the choices don't end there, right? How you measure cost is kind of tricky. You could measure cost by saying, what is the average distance of group members to the facility? You could measure it by saying, what's the average relative to the best possible scenario if you ignored everyone else? And you can get very different answers. So this is a very simple example where if I say I have lots of points, again, there are two groups measured in different colors, and I can measure what the best location of facility is according to different cost functions, you'll get very different answers. And what's fascinating here that the choice of how to measure cost mirrors the choices for those of you who are familiar in how some of the debates around measuring fairness for the classification or decision-making has gone out. Basically saying that these two notions are different. They capture different kinds of values and they only coincide when everything is perfect. All the clusterings are exactly perfect. All groups are, look exactly the same. And this again, for, for people who are familiar, this is very similar to these kinds of results we've seen for how different notions of fairness seem to capture different norms about what is appropriate. So we have some different ways of defining a cost measure and we can talk about which one we want. And then the question is, well, can we do something with this? Can we actually build better, right? Can we build a better allocation uh, or a better um, set of resources that people have access to, to achieve the seemingly equitable solution? So this gets into more technical details. And you know, we have a paper that sort of talks about this and I won't get into all of them there. The short answer, the short summary is that you can make some headway on this. You can bring in all the knowledge we have about how to do optimization. You can do this even if you change to some extent the notion of what it means to have access. For example, standing in line at a polling station is a problem of access. Even if you can get there easily, if you have to wait in a line that's a few hours long and apparently now it's illegal to give you water if you stand in line. Um, that could be a problem too. And so you want to factor that in as well as into the congestion at any particular access uh, facility that you want to access. So you could actually start thinking about how to build better uh, access to resources once you have all these different notions. And so there's a paper that we wrote on this and there's been a lot of follow-up work on this. There's been another paper that simultaneously came up with the same idea by Gadiri et al. And there's been some work now on improving the algorithms doing this. So, so that's great. You know, we can actually improve on this and we can sort of build better algorithms. But I think the... The important point here, right, is that it's not, it's not just a question of coming up with algorithms for problems. It's the question of re-articulating what is it we care about and what is it we want to measure. Because unfortunately, in a lot of the work we do, especially with data, if you can't measure it, you can't see it. And while we have to recognize the things we can't measure, we want to see what we can to make to pay more attention to things like access. And again, this is a more formal treatment. The question you can go back to is, well, what does this mean for an actual problem of access? And for example, voting rights. 
So this is a project that I've been working on with my colleague, Sorel Friedler, my student, uh, Mohsen Abbasi, and her student, Calvin Barrett. We've been looking at you know, collecting voter demographics and addresses and early voting polling locations in different states. We geocoded the addresses and we ran analysis and we have some initial results here. Now, I don't, you know, these results are very preliminary. These are not evidence of bias in any sort of significant way. We have to do a lot more statistical analysis to be sure of what we're seeing. The point is that you can already start seeing small discrepancies because we've come up with a way to measure what it means to have fair access, right? And again, I'm not, again, claiming that there are problems with North Carolina early voting locations or problems for them, but it's the start of a conversation where we can now say, can we use what we're learning about the way in which you're measuring discrepancies to start thinking, to start digging deeper into the data? And I think that's very important because in some sense, defining a measure and using this to measure something is a way of building essentially an audit mechanism and our accountability mechanism to detect where potential problems might be. And that's often even much more important than any kind of solution we might be claiming to come up with. So that's so much for a notion of access. That's a very physical notion of access. We are literally putting down facilities and locations and measuring distances. But there's another notion of access that's a bit more in the hypersphere, if you wish. <laughs> and it's about information flow. But access and the value of access is not, as I said, it's not a purely physical notion. For decades, sociologists have argued for the value of access within a social network. There's this idea of social capital, that's Judah Coleman, that says that basically within a social network, and I don't mean online, you know, in sort of in IRL, so in the social networks, before, you know, before we were all online, um, your standing with the network confers utility, right? The sort of idea that who you know is as important as what you know. And social position in a network, that's a class marker, not defined by the individual, it's not defined by demographics or income level or things like that. It's a class marker defined by the network itself. Now, access to power and influence by networks has always been the game. Ever since there have been people, there's been this issue of access to power. What's the problem is in the age of online social networks, the value of having a good network has compounded. And because these networks are not curated by individuals and often by the networks themselves, by recommendations and with incentives that are not aligned with individual goals, it's a weird kind of bias of its own, but one that emerges from the structure of the network. And so, um, Dana Boyd, Karen Levy, and Alice Marwick asked this question very presciently again in 2014. Should we be concerned about biases that emerge from your position in the social network? Especially if algorithms that are hungry for data and hungry for patterns start using network position as a way to make judgments about individuals. We know this happens already. People in the right places with the right connections hear about opportunities others don't. Recruiters start to target people using the right connections. Opportunities for training and new positions flow through existing channels. Academics might use their personal networks to recruit new hires. And that compounds itself because once you get an opportunity that improves your push network and that feed gets a feedback loop in and of itself. Even returning to our discussion of COVID testing, one challenge in Utah early on was making sure that information about testing and precautions was disseminated effectively in non-English speaking communities, where some a lot of the information that had been pushed out was in English and was therefore not getting to the right places. So how do we sort of even approach this question? One way to approach this is to think about just the flow of information itself, right? That's not the whole picture, but it's an important part of this picture, right? Information and what you do with it and who has access to it and who doesn't, right? Again, we've, people have studied for decades now how sort of information flows in different ways. There's notions of weak links, of strong ties, and you, know, you can think of edges in the social network as biased input data. How might we think about the somewhat narrower question of information access as a network as a, as a sort of a, a way to get into this broader question of social capital? Well, it turns out there's a very rich and well-developed framework for thinking about information flow. It comes from the work of marketing and advertising uh, within the computer science community. It's been around since at least the early 2000s and not before. It's called influence propagation. And you know, somewhat appropriately for this moment, it uses the same underlying mathematics that's used to model epidemic propagation. And the question is this. So you have a graph or a network and you have some mechanism for spreading information and you have nodes that have information. The question of influence maximization is, the, is a marketing question. How many other nodes can we influence with this information? So for example, you might have some nodes that have some information 
and there's a mechanism by which you know they spread information to some with some probability to their neighbors. So this node with some probability spreads information to a neighbor, and this node does the same thing too. Um, at which point this node is done; it doesn't doesn't participate in the diffusion process anymore. And if you're an epi epidemiologist, the language is uh, that of the SIR model. There was a node that was infected; it transmitted the disease to a susceptible neighbor, and then it recovered after that. And so. This process is a stochastic process. And you know, at some point it stops. And then you can say, well, how many nodes did we influence with these seeds? And so for each node, there is some probability that it will be, it will receive this information that will be influenced in some way. And so you can call it, we'll say we call this information PI and don't be, don't worry about sort of what looks like a horrific amount of jargon on the slide. Um, if a node gets a probability with a certain information, every node has a certain probability of getting some information and has different probability. And now you can say, well, how much utility or value have I achieved through the spread of information? One way to do this is to say, well, what's the expected number of nodes that get information? And that's just the average of all the probabilities that, that, uh, that function, uh, that expression mu r, which is this expected value. And then you can say, well, how many, if I have a budget of influence, how many, where should I place my influence sending out nodes to make sure that as many nodes get information as possible. And so this is the problem of influence maximization. There's been an extensive body of work on this in various forms and different measures. And you know we can go on for a long time talking about that. So this captures the idea of flow information, but does it capture the idea of equitable access? It turns out not quite. And so let's explore this a bit more. What does it mean to talk about sort of access, equitable access? Well, we can think about, you know, partitioning the graph or the network into two groups. We have the haves and the have nots. This is one set of nodes in the graph, another set of nodes, right? And you know, we can say that the, 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 the richness or the wealth of a set of nodes is the total utility, like the number of those nodes that are going to get this information. And maybe there's some group that is very likely to get useful information, there's one group that's not. And then we can talk about the gap as the difference in value between these two sets of nodes. Right, so if you, have, if you have a partition of graph into two parts, you can say, well, with this intervention, how much information did this group get versus this other group? What we don't want to happen is that you make interventions, you try to give more information, but all that happens is that the gap in access to information between one group and another increases, or as people often refer to this, that the rich get richer. And this is very easy to happen, right? Because Mathematically speaking, all you're trying to do is improve the, the total value, the utility, which can easily be done by making sure that a node that a 90% probability of getting information gets a 95% probability. I mean, that's fine. But if you know, you're at the same time ignoring the nodes that had 2% you know, chance of getting the information, it's gonna affect them a lot more. The value of equitable access is not maybe being captured by the optimization or the algorithmic framing in terms of influence maximization. And in fact, you can say this even more precisely. Um, you can actually precisely say that, and I'll, again, I'll translate what this says, is that for a very large class of functions you might try to come up with to try and optimize you know, access, this phenomenon will happen that in fact, the best thing to do to optimize the function is to allow the rich to get richer, which is not the thing you want for your system. So there's this value misalignment between what the optimization is encouraging your system to do, but what you really want. So then what do you do about this? Well, we've you know, started thinking about this. It's not an easy problem. You can come up with somewhat more sort of complicated criteria that look very messy that roughly summarize as that any intervention that maximizes utility must ensure that for any group, the utility improves. In particular, for the worst off group, the utility should improve. And this, should, this reminds you of a maximum from earlier. It will, because that's exactly the same thing. It basically says, try to make sure that the worst off individuals have some improvement, have a decent amount of improvement, and then try to do some intervention based on that. It turns out if you, you know, set up your criteria correctly, it turns out that that's exactly what happens, that the, the desirable goal of making sure that everyone improves is achieved with a different kind of cost function that says, find the node a minimum PI and make sure it's as large as possible. And even more so, any of the other measures that people have tried to look at amongst a large class of them, don't do it. <laughs> so once again, once you've identified the, what you want and you've identified the misalignment, you can start trying to ask how to redesign 
to get a better alignment with your goals. And again, there are catches here. It's all, again, there's, you, you get nothing for free. This goal tends to be a lot harder. It's a lot, it's, you know, there's a technical term for it. Basically, it's not nice to optimize. And unlike some of these other measures, it's going to be hard to find the best intervention. This is something people are beginning to look at right now. And heuristics are great, not yet. But this is work in progress right now. And so what I want to do is sort of turn to some, you know, having given you these two examples, sort of go back to sort of the broader perspective that I was trying to sort of talk about earlier, and then go back and look at how these examples maybe fit into this paradigm. We had talked about a value-laden value -laden evaluation of a system. We talked about how to reveal the values implicit in an algorithmic framework. And what I've been trying to argue with these two examples is that one way in which you look at the values implicit in an algorithmic framework is to look at choices made in the design in particular choices in optimization that we talked about. Also choices in representation, choices in what data collect. All of these choices that are often framed either as a default choice or as the easy choice or as the computationally efficient choice have a certain value um, implicit in them. And by sort of exposing them and in staring at them very carefully and thinking about it, you can actually try to articulate what those values are and then try to articulate the inability that why they can't capture what you want. And um, if you notice in this thing, in each of these green boxes, we talked about the values in the framework, the uh, normative concerns in a framework and frameworks for normative, the pattern looks the same, right? In each case, you have this interaction between what you want and what your systems are doing. And that's very important, right? Because going back to the broader question of how does computer science or how do computer scientists work harmoniously in the space with others? What this says is that at every step of the way, whether it's about um, analysis or introspection or building, this is one of those things you have to do in conjunction with the reflection on the norms and the values that you want. It can't, doesn't happen separately. At every stage of the process, you need to have this interaction. And I think that's sort of the message that I'm trying to convey here, right? That, that a, way, a way to approach critical algorithmic design from inside computer science is to recognize the places where computer scientists have the technical skills to intervene in our systems and interpret them by now analyzing them, introspecting them and building in conjunction with a broader discussion of values where we are one entity, but there are many, many other people who can speak to these questions as well. A nice book on this regard, which is, so in some circles is what is called the alignment problem, how to align machine learning with human values by Brian Christian has just come out. Um, if people are interested in more about this, they can take a look at this. But this question I think is, an, is both a very old question as well as a new question, right? How do we make sure the systems we design align with the values we seek to espouse? And this is, I think, true for any kind of formalization or mathematization of a system, whether it's coming from economics, whether it's coming from computer science, coming from using physics or so on. I'd like to conclude here. Um, I'm looking forward to the questions that I'm seeing sort of come up in the Q&A and I think uh, I'm hoping for a good discussion. I just want to acknowledge sort of all the, all the people who sort of helped me get where I am. Um, I work very closely with my colleagues, Cyril Friedler and Carla Schedegger, uh, who are at Haverford and Arizona respectively. We call ourselves a band. We have band practice every week and we jam on stuff and every now and then we put out an album. It's a good metaphor for how we function because most times we're just kind of fooling around with stuff and every now and then songs come out of it. We have special guest performances. Uh, Andrew Selch at UCLA, who's uh, a, a, my sort of legal whisperer who sort of explains a lot to me in a way that you know he knows how to explain so I can understand it because I'm not smart enough otherwise. Dana Boyd, who has this knack of sort of twisting my brain in ways that are very painful, but always sort of change me irrevocably. We have many collaborators who come on for an album or a song or two. Uh, Janet Vertesi at Princeton, Karen Levy, uh, Cornell, uh, Mark Alfano, Neil Petwari, Christian Lum, Aaron Horowitz, and Burkerson, all people who come from very different backgrounds, very different perspectives who sort of have helped, you know, uh, me sort of broaden and learn a lot about how tech fits into this broader societal framework we've been thinking about. My wonderful students who've been sort of instrumental in doing you know, pretty much all the work that we've been doing so far. And I also wanna thank the National Science Foundation and, and Mozilla for a sort of support for all the work that we've been doing. And with that, I'll conclude. Thank you very much for listening to me and I'm looking forward to our discussion. Thank you, Suresh. Um, we now have time for some audience questions. You can send us your questions via the Q&A box. Um, Indy Gupta and I will moderate. And I will read aloud our first question from the audience. Would you like me to stop sharing, Carrie, or should I keep it on? Um, whatever you feel most comfortable with. Okay, I'll leave it on just in case there's a slide, but I'll, I'll, I'll say, yeah. Okay, sounds good. 
Um, the first question is from Syed Mustafa Ali. What sense of justice is at work here? For example, do reparations feature in it? And what is the scope? Meaning, is it local, regional, global, et cetera? Good question. I think, you know, I, I, in the, in, so let me distinguish the examples from the frame, from the sort of broader perspective. I think the broader perspective is, you know, is, can and should include a very, very broad definition of justice, including, it's funny you mentioned reparations. One of the things that um, my colleague, Sorel Friedler has been arguing for is to think about what it might mean to do reparations for AI and what that even looks like. I don't even know the answer yet, but we've been thinking about that. In the context of these two examples though, I think our goals have been much more modest. It's been focusing on the specific question of equity of access. And can we make sure we can you know, improve access to these resources in a way that's sort of balanced and fair across different groups? So it's a much more narrow perspective there. Um, um, we aren't yet talking about broader questions like reparations. The next question is from Chirag Shetty. Um, it's a long question, so I'm gonna kind of paraphrase uh, the key of it. Uh, he asks, since we're talking about fairness, I am tempted to think about the core causes of unfair access or allocation. From what we read in the news, it doesn't seem like the problem is lack of algorithms for fairness or proof of unfairness. Rather, it is the unwillingness of the systems in place to go that extra distance to ensure fairness. Is this accurate? Are we being too academic about the problem? I think that's very accurate. And, I, and then it's, a, it's, a good, it's a very good question, right? Because it, it gets into another thing that I haven't talked about here, but this issue of frames. I have tried to frame these in a very, very narrow technical frame by design, because I was talking about the role that computer scientists can play. But you are correct that the frames around this, especially around, let's say, voting access, are much broader frames that involve power, that involve, you know, you know, partisan political advantage, as well as other kind of other more broader societal sort of exertions of power and the unwillingness to give up power. The question then is not so much whether these ideas are going to lead to change. What I argued for, and I think is true, is that the ability for, for, for better or for worse, and I'm not you know, necessarily saying I'm proud of this, but for better or for worse, the ability to put a kind of mathematical sort of quantization on some of these inequalities has been a way to sort of focus people's minds on what's really going on. In particular, if you had a policy that looks facially neutral, like oh, and things about, you know, let us change access to early voting that looks on its surface face neutral, a measure that says, oh, when you do that, this changes the access patterns in this way and, and look at the discrepancy you can compute and find, tends to sort of allow the discussion to move forward in a way rhetorically that can often be hard in other ways. So while I think there are many, many ways in which one has to, you know, think about pushing back against attempts to reduce access. This is one way that I have found to be, you know, surprisingly effective at sort of changing the discussion and changing the discourse around it. And that's why I think it's helpful to do this, even to come up with the measures. Again, I'm not selling the solutions per se, but I'm selling definitely arguing that the measures are helpful in this regard. Uh, the next question is from Melissa, uh, Melissa Osipet. And she asks, at what stage in CS education should these topics be explored? And what are the best practices to teach this perspective? There is a, a vibrant and very ongoing debate. Um, as a teacher, I have been paying attention to these debates. I've been sort of thinking about this myself. I've been designing courses and course material um, along with many of my colleagues. But there's a you know, very large debate on when we should teach these how we should teach them. Are they you know, insertions into a regular classroom? Or is it a standalone coursework? Can we realistically expect you know, computer scientists to achieve this kind of broader perspective? Should we bring in teams of thinkers from different departments? Should we have a more interdisciplinary focus? The answers are sort of, the real answer is stay tuned, but we're trying out a bunch of different things, both inside computer science, both more broadly in an interdisciplinary way, building new programs, new ways of thinking, maybe new disciplines, I don't even know yet, to sort of bring this 
sort of more societal focus to the work that we do. I think there will always be a place for a very pure sort of technically forced education. The question is how we integrate that with this broader societal understanding in a way that allows us to have well-trained technologists who also understand the ramifications and consequences of the tools that we build. Next question is from Brenna Levitin who asks, can you talk a bit more about the process of realizing that justice did have a place in computer science after your initial knee-jerk denial? Do you have any advice on how to frame this to other computer scientists? I have struggled in the past. That's a very good question. And, you know, uh, and again, in my answer, I will talk about myself and my own journey. So I'm not going to, I don't want to judge anyone else. I, I have had to struggle with this myself. So let me, I'll be honest about that. I think as a technologist, right, we, we, you know, as a, it seems more and more not a great joke, but it, it's 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 a joke that I used to make that I, I went into computer science because I didn't want to deal with people. And I think a lot of students still think about it that way. The first thing we have to do is maybe change the perspective because the successes of computer science have meant that the outputs of our field have um, have become more and more relevant to society broadly. Um, and so, we have to be aware. We have to be aware of the way role that our our work is having. So that's one thing. That's more. I feel that that's somewhat of a, a finger wagging approach. to This. The other way I like to think about this, and I really genuinely think this is true, is that we have a lot of power in the way we design problems and try to solve them. I've given you a couple of examples here, but there's so much more we could be doing. There's a lot of creativity that remains untapped if we don't allow ourselves to ask these more broader questions, we don't allow ourselves to pivot away from the way we've always asked questions. And if we don't allow ourselves to think more broadly, I think having access to more questions, to more creative ways of designing computations, to more creative ways of building technology that can sort of harness human flourishing is an exciting thing for computer scientists. It's something we should embrace. And in that sense, I'm weirdly enough an optimist in the sense that I think that there's a lot more that we can do. We just have, maybe finished only the first phase of how we do com computer science, maybe if you want to call it that. And there's a new phase where we can, you know, you know, spend more time thinking about questions in human computer interaction, spend more time thinking about sort of the user side of technology. And there's many, many more wonderful things we can do. We just have to be bold enough and willing enough to embrace new questions of that kind. Next question is from Tanvi Bajpai. She asks a very general question. Do you have any advice for students from specific disciplines who want to get involved in fairness work? That is, how do we work towards combining these multifaceted views and what skills should we work to build? I get this question a lot and I'm pausing because I wanna make sure I can give an answer that's, you know, that's not like learn everything, <laughs> which I don't think is the answer, right? Uh, I, I'm still learning, right? So how have I done it again? So what have I done? I had you know, my core in computer science, right? I've worked with people who have a core in other disciplines. We found, we had to find ways to engage. We had to find ways to connect, maybe on one problem or one question, find ways to bridge issues of jargon, of language, of, of dialogue, of the way different disciplines approach questions in their field. And it usually came not because I had this sort of missionary zeal to sort of learn about the world. It's more like, okay, I have to solve this problem. I don't, I, I know that I don't know something. <laughs> I think that's the first step, right? Know that you don't know something. Find someone who does know it and ask them and learn. And I think everything I've learned has been because, okay, I had this funny feeling that there's something out there that I do not know that other people know way better. I need to go find someone who can tell me about it. <laughs> and then work with them and try to, and then realize, okay, my initial way of thinking about this was totally wrong. Now that they've educated me, we can have a better way of asking the question. And now I can either answer it or maybe move on to something else because this is not a question I know I can answer. And in every respect I've learned by doing that. So not by sort of saying, I will now be, be an expert in economics. Or I will now become a philosophy expert. More like, okay, I have a small question and I need someone who can help. <laughs> so build a network, build connections to people. Uh, to people who can, who are interested in these questions, who may not, maybe, maybe won't work with you for a couple of years, but just can talk to you and you can share what you know about your field. They can share what they know and eventually the magic happens. That's how I've seen it happen. Uh, the next question is from Martin Wolska, who says, I much appreciate the technical exploration of algorithmic bias and justice in relation to infrastructures, frameworks, and norms within a social justice framework. This seems to match strongly 
um, uh, with work bringing together Rawls Minimac Justice Framework with SENS Capability Approach and Client's Choice Framework. Is this an accurate read? I think it's a very complimentary read because you're giving me a lot more credit than I deserve. But yes, um, I have, uh, you know, so I, you know, I, I have colleagues who will sort of tear their hair out every time I say we're using a Rawls Union framework because I'm oversimplifying greatly. Um, and I, I acknowledge that. I think that trying to engage more with these frameworks is how I have begun to change some of my thinking. Let me just put it that way. I think they have helped me think more deeply about these questions. They have realized they've helped me realize that there are much more complex and interesting perspectives that can be brought to these very technically focused questions. And we need to do more of that. I know of colleagues who've been trying to wrestle with Amartya Sen's frameworks with capabilities and functionalities and bring that in. And I think that's work is fascinating as well. Next question is from Diane Uwaku. She asks, is it really possible to design an algorithm that would redefine balance as fairness of access? How can they be generalized to all contexts? Um, I, I don't, so I'm not sure I fully understand the question. I would say that I don't think you can capture all notions of fairness and access by one algorithm. And I would strongly caution against trying to do that. I would not claim to do that either. I think we were trying to capture a very narrow way of thinking about access, namely like distance traveled. And like I said, even that is incomplete because things like access to a resource where you have to stand in line for it it may be close to your house, but if you have to stand for two hours, that's not access. So I think this is a way to get into the question of access, but most likely there'll be different notions that are important that you then have to capture maybe with different approaches. So I, in fact, I'm arguing for a more specialized approach rather than a more general approach. Uh, the next question is from Lav Varshne, uh, who asks for the voting access project, do you consider the transportation network infrastructure and Lev asked this in the context of some work he has done uh, on graph augmentation for equitable access. That's a great question. We, so, you know, our initial sort of very hesitant forays into this have not. And I think you have to, because again, the more you want to capture what's really happening with access, the more you have to capture, well, you know, maybe there's only, maybe there's only one or two roads that get to this area. Maybe some people have to drive. Maybe people don't have access and need to take the bus. How do you factor all that? So we have not captured transport. And that's a very good example of how, as you get more complexity, you get sort of both more realistic, but you have, but you have to sort of model this a bit more carefully as well. So that's something we have not done yet. Uh, next question is from Said Mustafa Ali. To what extent is the focus on access obscuring differential capacity to use, which is in turn an artifact of legacy systemic asymmetric power relations? Um, when you say differential capacity, uh, I guess you mean, you know, how is access ignoring the fact that, you know, why aren't you just building more facilities? And that's how I'm interpreting the question as. So if that's hopefully that's correct. I agree. And in fact, I was very, so one of the things that's interesting here is that People had talked about fair clustering. And again, from a technical point of view, clustering is a problem where you have a fixed set of resources that you have to allocate. You have K cluster centers, or that's how it's called. Why K? Why not have more, right? Why can't you build more facilities? There's no reason why you couldn't. In fact, this gets you to a different question. It's called facility location. And that's one of the questions we do look at. And so that allows you to say, well, maybe there's, maybe I can get a better notion of access, get a better quality access if I build more, but it's gonna cost me to build more and now I have a trade-off. And now you're gonna say, well, is there a trade-off? Is there a real trade-off? Are you just making up the trade-off? What is the cost of the trade-off? These are all questions you can now start asking. So the, the framework of fair access might allow you to expand to more of these questions. At some point it will probably not work and you have to then generalize this further or not generalize, but so specialize this further to capture those questions. But you're totally right that policies around whether you should build more facilities are, are in some sense beyond the scope of the formalism and we should recognize that they're beyond the scope and recognize that that's another sort of layer of complexity on top of all of this. The next question is from Daniela Delgado Ramos, uh, who wonders how we can come up with the best measurement unit of cost when populations not only have different characteristics and resources, but also have different values themselves. How can we assure that systems that make what we want to do fairer in general terms, because CS practition, practitioners and developers probably have more in common with each other than with people uh, more in need? How do we include them in the cycle in developing these solutions? So that's a very good question, right? And the issue of sort of participatory work in this space. 
So one thing that we were worried about was, right, how do we even know what access means for the case of, say, voting, right, just very narrowly? So it turns out there's a lot of literature on this. If you look at work in political science and even in polling, there are studies that will say, well, you know, we what we've seen is that when the the lines get beyond a certain length, people, you know, who can are sort of just sort of don't bother to go and vote, and you start seeing turnout drops in certain ways. Or if you have to drive more than X number of miles to get to a polling booth, you are less likely by this much fraction to actually show up and vote. So you can, so on the one hand, you can try to get a better understanding of what the real barriers to access are by understanding what the literature says on this. Now, and again, this is so, this brings up another point, right? There is a, a valid concern in a lot of this work that without true participatory design, you are going to miss a lot of the real concerns that people have. I think this is correct. What I'm uncomfortable about is the idea that then you should not do anything at all, or you should not even explore any questions at all. I think it's important to still explore and be very, very careful of the limitations of what you're doing, but still be able to make some building of insights even if it's purely from a technical perspective to inform this broader discussion about what it means to have access. And I think that's why, again, I go back to the title of my talk, right? This is the view from inside computer science. We are part of the puzzle. We are not the only part of the puzzle. There's a much more complex ecosystem of stakeholders and thinking that goes into this. The parts that we can contribute to are an, a deeper understanding of the limitations of various technical approaches. But this should be married with, again, a participation in this broader discussion. So for example, you know, again, one of the things that we are you know, hoping to do with, uh, and again, I, well, I, one of the things we are hoping to do with our sort of the work we're doing with access is to, is to partner with organizations who are thinking, who are on the ground thinking about voting rights, right? And, and that's something, but, but we, we're not at the stage yet where we can go and talk about it. We're still trying to understand what we can say from a purely tech. And that, that's, I think, is a, is a stage we are at right here. So I think, if you remember that picture I showed up earlier where all these parts are interacting, one of the things that I'm leery of is people looking at that complicated picture and saying, oh my God, this is too complicated. You know, we can't do anything unless we can do everything. I do not think that is true. I just think we have to be very careful in making claims about what we're doing so that we don't claim that one little piece of the puzzle can solve everything. That doesn't mean we shouldn't do anything at all. Uh, the next question is from Melissa Osipek. How do the questions of quantifying data or missing data relate to what is valued as data and what is considered a worthwhile way of collecting it? So then a very broad question, right? That speaks to way beyond anything I mentioned, but let me give you a, a way to address this question, even from the things I mentioned, right? For example, one of the things I said was that you can get voter information and you can do geocoding to figure out lat latitude and longitude to figure out things like distances. It turns out that you know, there were huge discrepancies in which addresses we could get latitude longitude for and which ones we couldn't. Coincidentally, in North Carolina, we were unable to get quality geocoded information for a lot of voters who were listed, again, in the data that we had as being Native American. Why is that? Why is it that all the missing data is in one particular group and not another? These are things we need to dig into further, which is why I said, you know, we, do, we don't yet know what this data is telling us. But these are the kinds of things that come up when you start looking at the data more carefully, that there are huge discrepancies in terms of what you can collect and what data, what the data says to you, depending on who, whose data you're collecting. And that, that, that brings up a, you know, a whole bunch of other questions that, you know, I think are important to sort of keep in mind. All right, we'll close with one more short question because we're running out of time. Uh, the last question is from Gareth Scott Road, who asks, you talked about modeling propagation of information, but is modeling being done of simultaneous propagation of information and misinformation and the interactions between the two, or is this even a tractable modeling problem? Ah, so there's a rich and sort of very literature on different ways to model information flow. You are correct that, you know, this is a somewhat, um, how should I say, a benign version of this? I mean, if you, of course, you were at Joan Donovan's talk, you know that, you know, there's nothing benign about the flow of information, especially in social networks. This is a much narrower sort of angle on this, looking at only information flow, which is not subject to misinformation. And again, that's, a, that's a, another lens, right? So in, 
in the way we think about these designs, right? We think of them as in terms of layers and also in terms of threat models. One way to think about say, well, you know, since we have not captured the threat model of misinformation in such a setting, it's not clear whether this model captures anything. And I think that's valid to some extent. But I think in some of the settings where we worry about information flow, especially in things like recruiter networks, that we don't really see the same level of covert or sort of direct misinformation attacks. What you tend to see more of is sort of, how should I say, more by negligence or sort of omission, groups you know, not communicating the right way just because we don't have the right kind of networks to communicate with. So I think it's important to understand what the threat models in these situations are. And, and in the case we were looking at information access, it was a very narrow threat. In fact, we've often been wondering whether any of this applies to the questions of misinformation and we realize that that's a much more complex problem. And that's why I, haven't, I didn't mention misinformation and disinformation, which I think requires a different set of techniques that are more adversarial. So thank you, Suresh. Thank you for your talk and for the time you're spending with us and sharing your ideas with us. Um, it's been amazing. We also want to thank, uh, take a moment to thank our production team and invite them to re-video on the screen. None of this would be possible without the back-end work of Mitchell Oliver, Jingyi Gu, Vinay Koshi, Gabe Mallo, Adrian Wong, Cheyenne Putz, Katie Peterson, and our SLS translators, Laura and Nick from UIC's DRES office. Thank you. And thank you all for joining us today. A recording of this talk, as well as the links shared in our chat today, will be posted to our website. Join us again for our next event with Ali Arani, who will be speaking on claiming democracy over digital infrastructures on Wednesday, April 28th, same time, same day of the week, three weeks from now. We hope to see you all there. Thank you again, and a round of applause for our speaker. Thank you all for the questions.